Thank you very much for having me here. I'm delighted to, to talk. As you can see from my PowerPoint, I was not expecting to talk about affirmative action. Instead, I, was, I prepared a presentation to deal with uh, complex identities. Because this panel does deal with affirmative action, I will speak for briefly uh, on affirmative action and then turn to my prepared uh, remarks. There are three differences between the affirmative action program in India and affirmative action as it exists in the United States. One, you have co a constitutional provision uh, that guarantees affirmative action. We have no such constitutional guarantee. Two, you have a specific set aside uh, for uh, various castes uh, and other um, groups. We don't uh, have any set-asides in the United States that are um, allowed pursuant to our Constitution. And three, there is a strong, there appears to be a very strong social justice component to the system in India, whereas I will maintain that the social, social justice uh, aspect of affirmative action in the United States has been ameliorated over time and no longer exists. So let me talk briefly about affirmative action in the United States. As I said uh, a few seconds ago, there is no constitutional provision for affirmative action. Instead, affirmative action began in the public sector in the 1960s as a result of a series of executive orders that were issued by President Kennedy and President Johnson. These executive orders applied to federal contractors and federal governmental employers. There have been a number of constitutional challenges to affirmative action programs in the United States almost from the very beginning or the inception of these policies. One of the primary challenges took place in 1978 in a landmark case called the University, called Bakke versus the University of California. This case involved a student uh, who a person who applied to the University of California Davis School of Medicine. Uh, he was denied admission. He brought a lawsuit alleging, this is a white man, Alan Bakke, he brought a lawsuit alleging that people of color who had uh, less um, creden credentials, uh, uh, less uh, prominent CV, uh, were admitted uh, instead of him. So this is a classic reverse, reverse discrimination uh, lawsuit. What's important about the Bakke case is that the U.S. Supreme Court rejected a number of bases for affirmative action measures, including using affirmative action as a mechanism to cure societal discrimination. Uh, at the time, it was fairly well known and uncontested that there was broad-based discrimination in the United States, uh, and the Supreme Court said that this sort of amorphous, broad-based, uh, an attempt to uh, address, to redress uh, this broad-based uh, societal discrimination was an inadequate justification for affirmative action policies. In addition to that, the Supreme Court rejected the notion that an institution like the University of California Davis School of Medicine could use affirmative action uh, to ensure that there were role models uh, for individuals in a particular uh, profession like uh, the medical profession. So the role model theory was rejected by the U.S. Supreme Court. It was also offered, uh, argued by the university uh, that affirmative action was necessary to ensure that there were an adequate number of doctors uh, in underrepresented minority communities. And the Supreme Court rejected that as a basis for affirmative action measures. That left two justifications for affirmative action. One, as a remedy for identifiable acts of discrimination. Um, uh, and, uh, and two, diversity. In the 1980s, in a very significant case uh, called Richmond versus Croson, this was a 1989 case, the U.S. Supreme Court cut back substantially, and we can talk more about this in the Q&A session, um, on the remedial justification. The Supreme Court said that an institution, and in this case it was a city, the city of Richmond, could only use affirmative action if that city had engaged in specifically identifiable 
acts of discrimination. So the Supreme Court uh, basically said general discrimination engaged in by an actor would not be enough. You needed to point to specific acts of discrimination. So that cut back on the remedial justification. That left diversity. Now note that all of these other justifications that I've been talking about, or at least many of them, uh, have embedded in them a social justice component, right? Uh, remedying societal discrimination has a social justice component. Uh, remedying uh, historical acts of discrimination also has a social justice component. The Supreme Court in a series of cases limited that aspect of affirmative action, leaving the diversity uh, rationale and in 2003 into uh, significant cases involving the University of Michigan, the Supreme Court said that institutions can uh, use uh, affirmative action, consider race in their admissions policies uh, to secure greater uh, student body uh, diversity. Uh, and part of the appeal of the diversity rationale, it is believed by those who study affirmative action in the United States, is that it benefits uh, everyone. Everyone benefits uh, from uh, diversity. There's been substantial pushback against affirmative action in the United States. Um, some people have argued that affirmative action compromises merit uh, because persons who are not qualified are now being admitted to uh, institutions of higher learning or are gaining employment in circumstances where there are better qualified individuals. Um, as I said earlier, you have uh, a policy in India where there are specific uh, set-asides uh, in the United States, the idea that you would have a certain percentage of individuals who must be uh, included in a certain uh, workplace or in the political arena or uh, in educational institutions is not tolerated uh, and our Supreme Court has said that that is un unconstitutional. There is a concern about stigma that uh, people of color and women who benefit from affirmative action are stigmatized by virtue of these policies and therefore they ought to be uh, eliminated. And then the final argument against affirmative action is harms uh, innocent whites, those who did not actually perpetuate in the historic discrimination that has led to such broad-based uh, inequality in the United States. Those are the criticisms from the right. From the left, um, many people have argued that affirmative action has been gutted of any meaning, uh, of any um, of any ability to address broad-based uh, social inequality because there is no uh, social justice uh, aspect left to affirmative action. It cannot serve as a distributive justice uh, uh, mechanism. Other scholars from the left have also criticized affirmative action, and Lonnie Guineer, who is a professor at Harvard University, has made this argument most recently, uh, where she's argued that affirmative action only benefits uh, a small percentage of individuals in the United States. So if you think in terms of a pyramid, um, a triangular pyramid, uh, her argument is that affirmative action has taken uh, a few people from the middle and allowed them to go to the top of the pyramid, but it does nothing to destabilize those individuals who are at the bottom of the pyramid. So what affirmative action has done is to uh, 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 give the guise of legitimacy to a system that is not uh, addressing uh, broad-based uh, social inequality. Uh, so that's my brief uh, overview uh, of affirmative action. And now let me uh, turn and I'll give a very abbreviated um, presentation uh, of my prepared uh, remarks so that we can uh, attempt to, ta to uh, stay uh, on time. So what I plan to talk about uh, is women. The title of this conference is Dalits and African Americans in the 21st Century, Learning from Cross-Cultural Experiences. When you think about African Americans, do you think about me? When you think about Dalits, do you only think about men, or do you also think about women? In 1982, Professor Gloria Hall edited a volume of essays entitled, All the Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men, But Some of Us Are Brave. As Hall's title provocatively points out, examinations of race in the United States tend to focus on the experiences of black men. Similarly, examinations of gender tend to focus on the experiences of white women. Omitted from the analysis and indeed invisible 
are the experiences of women who exist at the intersection of race and gender, that is, black women and more broadly, women of color. In recent decades, legal scholars in the United States have built upon the critical insights of black feminists like Hall and have pressed courts to acknowledge that social categories like race, gender, class, religion, and sexual orientation cannot be analyzed independently of, of each other and that in many cases, uh, people experience discrimination along multiple axes uh, or multiple dimensions. Thus, an Asian woman may allege that she was discriminated against not because she is a woman or Asian, but because she is an Asian woman. Intersectionality theory is closely associated with anti-essentialism. Essentialism is the notion that there is a singular woman's or any other group's experience that can be described independently from other aspects of the person, that there is an essential core and essence to that experience that all women share, and that is, a, that is the same across time, space, and different historical, social, political, and personal context. Anti-essentialism theory pushes back against this framework and asserts that women's experiences cannot be examined separately from other aspects of their identity, including race and class, and I would posit in India, uh, 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 caste uh, status. It's important to note that the experiences of those whose uh, identities exist at the intersection of two subordinate categories is not merely additive. Additive, In other words, the experiences of black women should not be reduced to uh, the experiences of black men plus white women or a combination of maleness and, uh, uh, excuse me, of femaleness and race. Rather, race and gender interact to produce a unique social position that must be analyzed on its own terms. Sometimes a baking metaphor is used to uh, describe the intersectional experience. So when one bakes, I'm not a cook, but hopefully this will work, uh, you start with certain ingredients. Let's assume that one is uh, creating a cake. Butter, uh, sugar, and flour would be essential ingredients. Uh, you start with those ingredients, but the final product will be something very differently, different from the constituent uh, elements. And that is the argument with intersectionality uh, theory. I want to take a moment briefly to discuss how intersectionality and anti-essentialism shapes the ways in which women of color are viewed differently from white women and men of color. So note that the identities of white women and men of color are comprised of both privileged and unprivileged markers. Thus, at times, these individuals may be subject to oppression, while at other times, they may be the oppressor. For example, white women in the United States, because they are women, may be subject to sexual harassment and sexual violence and other forms of gender-based subordination. Yet at other times, because of their whiteness, they have the, have the power to exclude and to marginalize others based upon racial prejudice and stereotypes. In other words, white women may be racist. Uh, and so it's important that you not think that there is this sisterhood among all women that naturally exists uh, in the United States. There are substantial differences among women. Similarly, men of color, because they are racial minorities, may be oppressed in the United States, as we've seen in recent weeks, uh, because of their race. Yet because of their maleness, they, they may be subject to, set, uh, to sexism and indeed may perpetuate violence against women of color on this basis. This is an exercise that I often engage in with my students to try to point out the ways in which uh, women of color are differently situated. So I ask them to close their eyes and uh, to come up with common stereotypes of Asian Americans in the United States. And this is usually the list that they come up with. And then I ask them to close their eyes and imagine common stereotypes of Asian American women, just to point out how Asian American women are different from Asian American men uh, based upon their sex. 
and they come up with this uh, list. This is a blunt instrument, but at least it begins to show uh, the ways in which women of color are differently situated uh, from uh, men uh, of color. One could do uh, the same exercise by comparing Asian women to white women, and thus you might be able to tease out the ways in which race uh, situates uh, those uh, groups of women uh, differently. Again, I acknowledge that that is a blunt instrument. Note that intersectionality theory uh, and positing the ways in which women are differently situated, women of color are differently situated, is not merely a theoretical matter. Women of color are differently situated when it comes to rates of poverty, when it comes to unemployment, and as this graph shows, when it comes to uh, in if you look at the far right uh, chart, you will see that in general women tend to make uh, earn less income than men in the United States, but you'll also note uh, that African American women tend to earn less uh, than African American men, situating them differently from African American men. They also, if you look at the far column, uh, earn less than uh, white women, differently situating them uh, from uh, uh, white women. Asian women are in a slightly different category, and we can talk about uh, that uh, uh, in the Q&A. Uh, because I'm a legal scholar, uh, and I'll be short uh, just to uh, keep us on time, I always look for legal interventions uh, to uh, problems of social inequality. Uh, inter intersectionality cases were brought in courts uh, in the United States in the 1980s. Uh, most of the cases involved uh, a black woman bringing a lawsuit against her employer, uh, arguing that the employer was discriminating against black women. The employer would push back uh, and say that it, it did not engage in gender discrimination because there would be white women employed in the workplace, and then the employer would argue that it did not engage in race discrimination because there were black men employed in the workplace and the black women were arguing uh, we're not saying that you uh, are not discriminating against black men or white women but you are discriminating against black women most of the courts early on uh, rejected intersectionality theory, but for a number of reasons, primarily due to the advocacy of black feminists, courts over time began to accept uh, these claims. I'm not going to go through uh, the analysis that was set forth by the courts in the interest of time, but I do want to point out that even though courts have started to accept intersectionality lawsuits, in other words, to recognize these claims such that plaintiffs can proceed uh, to litigate the cases, plaintiffs still tend uh, to lose. Indeed, uh, an empirical study that was done in 2011 of intersectionality claims uh, showed that plaintiffs who make intersectional claims are only half as likely to win their cases as plaintiffs who allege a single basis of discrimination. So it's one thing for the court to recognize your claim. It's another thing to be able to uh, uh, convince a jury or a judge that you ought to prevail um, uh, with the lawsuit. We can talk about other complexities with intersectionality. What happens when you uh, not only have a black woman bringing a claim, but what if the claim is being brought by a black, Latina, lesbi les lesbian, Muslim woman from Mexico? Should uh, that sort of intersectional claim uh, be cognizable? I want to go back with where I began, and that is with the central insight of intersectionality uh, theory. Uh, and that insight, when Hall wrote that all the blacks are men and all the women are white, she was pointing to the tendency to ignore black women in both feminist struggles and in struggles for racial justice. Black women, it seemed, did not matter. Yet black feminists have been asserting that we do matter. And indeed, black women have changed, have played a critical role in social justice movements in the United States. I'd like to take 30 seconds to introduce you to some of those uh, women. For example, Sojourner Truth, was the conductor of the Underground Railroad, and railroad uh, during the uh, slavery period, and she famously said that she saved a thousand slaves, and she did, and could have freed uh, a thousand more if only they knew they were slaves. Sojourner Truth interrupted or disrupted a white feminist conference in 1880 and bravely asked, aren't I 
a woman, or in her words, ain't I a woman, uh, challenging conceptions of womanhood uh, that were prevalent at the time. Let's see. Rosa Parks, that seamstress in Alabama who wouldn't give up her seat on a bus and contributed to the Montgomery boycott, which was a critical spark for the U.S. civil rights uh, movement. Then we have Fannie Lou Hamer, a powerful advocate for voting rights who professed that she was sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> and we say that often in the United States today. To Mahalia Jackson, an African-American gospel singer with the voice of angels who stood behind Martin Luther King during the March on Washington and prompted him repeatedly to talk about his dream, which led to that very famous I Have a Dream speech. Then we have Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, and Audre Lorde, who've helped us to see the insidious nature of the, forces, of the forces that tell us that we should hate our bodies and desire eyes that are not our own and skin that shuns the caress of the sun. And finally, last but not least, Angela Davis, the leader of the U.S. Communist Party and still a vocal advocate against, uh, in favor of prison reform and against the mass incarceration that we're experiencing in the United States. What these African American women, Latino women, and Asian American women, and I would posit Dalit women in India are saying is that our voices are important and our voices must be heard because it's only when we look to the bottom and address the circumstances of those who are multiply oppressed that we will all be free. I'm reminded in conclusion of the words of Anna Julia Cooper who said, only the black woman can say when and where I enter in the quiet undisputed dignity of my womanhood without violence and without suing or special patroness, then and there the whole race enters with me. And I would posit that the same is true of Dalit women in India. Thank you.